This week on Idaho Reports, we covered Idaho's school override elections, talked to the new corrections chief, and looked at the future of potlatch after the mill closure. Next week, how the state is cracking down on non-taxpayers and should the president reappoint Paul Volcker. I'm Mark Johnson. Join us weeknights here for Idaho Reports. Governor John Evans has tried for a long time to get the Idaho legislature to require quarterly tax payments from individuals and businesses who now pay taxes just once a year. He'll be trying again during a special session next month. Tonight on Idaho Reports, we'll look at the controversy surrounding quarterly tax payments. Is it a matter of fairness or could it be a blow to small business? The funding for this program is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Friends of 4, 10, and 12. Good evening. When a special session of the Idaho legislature convenes on May 9th, Idaho Governor John Evans, a Democrat, will be pushing for measures to increase state revenue. His favorite proposal, the quarterly collection of income taxes, is far from being a favorite with the Republican-controlled Idaho legislature. The governor has tried for three years in a row now to sell the quarterly collections to the legislature as a matter of fairness. He says it's a change in the tax system that, if not entirely painless, at least will add little burden to, the, to a small number of Idaho taxpayers. But opponents have fought the idea consistently to a standstill. They say quarterly collections will further burden small business by restricting their cash flow and by adding bookkeeping headaches. It is perhaps something more than a coincidence that the more than $20 million that could be generated from quarterly tax payments would be enough money to increase the 1984 budgets to a level the governor thinks adequate hence the call for a special session of the legislature. Again, just yesterday, the governor said the tax collection change would allow adequate funding of education. Tonight, we take a look at this issue. Is it a matter of fairness, or would it be a tough blow for small business? Producer Eric Malone begins tonight by backgrounding the numbers and the issues in this tax debate. We can, can secure uh, $19 million of additional monies without raising any taxes at all by initiating a quarterly collection of income taxes, just like the federal government does, just like um, many of the states in the nation uh, do that assess an income tax. If you paid more than $300 in state income tax this year, Governor John Evans wants you to make quarterly payments of your 1984 tax in advance. The federal government already has such a program, and 38 of the 46 states with income tax also require estimated tax payments four times a year. In Idaho, this would raise a one-time windfall of $22.4 million in 1984 if the program takes effect on July 1st of this year. Quarterly estimates would bring in an additional $4.5 million per year thereafter, over and above the current level of tax collections. The extra revenue comes from investing tax monies received earlier than usual. Implementation of the program would cost the Tax Commission about $700,000 in 1984 and about $250,000 extra in future years. Who would be affected? In Idaho, some 8,000 corporations and 30,000 individuals would be required to make quarterly tax payments. Those 30,000 include small businesses and professionals like doctors and lawyers who don't pay withholding tax on their salaries. But many small businesses say they don't like the idea of quarterly income tax payments. They're worried about liquidity and cash flow, and they want the ability to earn money on their money, rather than leaving that option to the state. In small business, having ready cash on hand for purchasing is important. Many small business owners object to prepayment of their taxes because they say they would have to borrow the money or dip into funds slated for improving their business. In rough economic times, small business operators say they need the money they can earn by investing idle funds until tax time in April. And some small businesses feel they are already at an economic disadvantage under Idaho's present tax structure. Large corporations, on the other hand, generally have the cash on hand to make estimated payments. Since they already pay quarterly estimates to the federal government, many support the idea at the state level, or at least they don't object to it as strenuously as small businesses do. Small businesses contend this would be an increased accounting burden and another added business expense. Those arguments have already been made this year in the Idaho legislature. Democrats generally favor the idea. Most Republicans oppose it. So we're looking at two things here. Corporations 
with a net taxable income over $50,000 and individuals above that same floor paying to the state their taxes uh, as individuals do presently with it withheld and, and paid to the state on a monthly basis, we would have them pay on a quarterly basis to the state. This idea has been under consideration uh, for some time. It's been a matter uh, that uh, we've considered for some time, and I uh, uh, really think this is a poor way to do this. Uh, it's really kind of an end run around the, uh, the House Committee who uh, hasn't sent it to us. So I would urge a negative vote on this. I hope we could defeat these amendments and uh, send, the, uh, uh, send the bill on its way. Thank you, Mr. President. Some of the debate in the state Senate just a couple of weeks ago over quarterly income tax payments. That debate coming late in the session and the proposal made little headway. The governor's chief lobbyist on the quarterly tax issue is Steve Seward, the director of the Division of Financial Management. Mr. Seward, first off, the governor argues this is a matter of fairness. How so? Well, Mark, 91 percent of the people pay their income taxes as they earn their money through their paycheck. Uh, you know that every time you get a paycheck, there's a portion withheld for the state income tax that is sent on to the state. Well, that's true for everyone, everyone except uh, about 11 percent of the taxpayers uh, on the individual income tax who are allowed to keep their money throughout the entire year um, and then give it to the state in one lump sum as of April 15th. That's a unique privilege that is afforded to a very small portion of the taxpaying public. And uh, the governor's thought is that uh, What's good for 91 percent ought to be good for the other 9 percent, and, and that's, that's his thinking. There has been so much resistance to this. Why? Well, it, it's a change. Any change to the tax structure is resisted, and it does take money out uh, away from people who currently have it. Um, uh, as a result, there are people who, who would prefer to have that money. I think that probably the 91 percent of the people who are paying their taxes now as they go would also prefer to, to keep it. But as a, as a matter of equity, I think it's, it's only reasonable to treat all taxpayers the same on this score. It is said uh, over and over, Mr. Seward, in the debate about this issue that you're really affecting a lot of small business people. Is that really, um, is that really who we're affecting here? Well, we're affecting small business people and large business people both um, to some degree. All of those people, all of the people who would become subject to quarterly payments under this plan are already subject to quarterly estimates uh, by the federal government. This law would apply to no one who is not already subject to the quarterly estimated system required by the federal government and required by all but one other of the nation's income tax states. Idaho is unique in the sense that it does not require quarterly estimates. Um, so uh, I guess this would make us more uniform in how we treat businesses uh, as compared to the federal government and as compared to other states. Mr. Seward, as you well know, the opponents argue that small business, particularly small business, needs and, and can use this money better than, this, than the state can, that it would uh, impact on their cash flow, and in some cases they would even have to borrow to make these payments. Are those concerns? Well, I know the argument, that argument is frequently made. Both the House and the Senate were presented with alternatives that would have exempted small business and didn't find those proposals any more attractive. That's what we heard Senator Bray talking right. about a moment ago on the videotape. Right. In addition, um, however, the money that small businesses are not forwarding to the state on a quarterly basis is ultimately going to be due to the state. If, as the tape suggested, they are improving their businesses uh, through that means, uh, they're going to have to come up with the money at some point on April 15th by taking it out of their business. So the money is due and owing to the state. Uh, the question is who's going to have the use of the money. Are, are the small businesses going to pay their taxes as they earn their income like the rest of us do, or are they going to, to be allowed to retain their money until the end of the year um, uh, as, as, a, as, a small, as a small segregated sector of the, uh, the tax? And your public. answer to that question of who should have control is, uh, of that money is that state government should have that money. Well, I don't think that they should be treated differently. I think the governor would be amenable to uh, the proposal that Senator Bray was talking about that would exempt small business. But as I say, that doesn't seem to be the real problem since the legislature has had difficulty with that proposal as well. We'll come back, sir. Thank you. Much of the opposition to quarterly income tax payments came from the House Revenue and Taxation Committee. The governor will find stiff opposition from that same committee should the idea surface during the special session. Boise Republican Rachel Gilbert is a member of that Revenue and Taxation Committee and one of the principal opponents of the quarterly payments idea. Mr. Seward just said it's a matter of fairness, Representative Gilbert. You don't agree? Well, Mark, I think it's not only just a matter of fairness that we're talking about. We're talking about several problems. And the biggest problem I see with this, it's a one-time fix. 
government's going to come in with their $22.4 million and they want to relieve the private sector of those, of those dollars. So what that does, it brings into place, sets into place the $22.4 million, which we will lock in place with government spending, bureaucracy uh, spending. So this year, we've got the $22 million to pay for that. But what happens next year when those dollars are not available? Then it means new revenue to cover the expenditures that we set up this year. I don't think that's right. I also think that this is a con uh, confiscation of working capital. Our business people need that money now, this year. Businesses are, on, businesses are barely making it now. We are reading about bankruptcies. We're reading, we know that people are losing their homes through foreclosure. Uh, and the statesman I read recently that 40% of the small businesses in Boise are in danger of going under. If we deprive them of these dollars, then I believe they're going to have to go into the private, uh, into the banking community to borrow the tax dollars to pay for that $22 million. So we're not talking just about the $22 million. We're talking about um, 15, 17% interest to borrow to pay those taxes. I think that's confiscatory. Now what's 15% uh, on 22 million would be about uh, what? $3.3 million in interest payments on that money. Small businesses especially can't, can't bear that burden right now for this year. I'm not worried about the HPs and the Boise Cascades. Let me interrupt just for a second to ask you what your estimate would be of how many people would be affected in that way, uh, would have to go to the credit market and borrow to make these payments. I would, I would, almost, I would almost be willing to bet that 95% of the business people would go into the marketplace to borrow 15 or 17 or 18% money if their credit is good enough to allow them to do that. So we're not talking about just the 22, we're talking about an approximate 25.7 million. Yep. I'm also concerned, Mark, about the extra bookkeeping. I've talked to accountants and they said there's no question. There'll be more bookkeeping, there'll be more accounting costs, and then there's always the matter of penalties. If the little businessman or the little businesswoman doesn't guess right and they don't pay their, their uh, estimates correctly, for a private individual, he must be right within 80%, but a corporation must guess right within 90%. So I think we're also looking at interest, we're looking at penalties, and I think that's a serious problem. But the biggest problem I see is setting in place another $22 million in government spending, and you know, the greed of government is without limit. We'll spend all of it that you'll give us, me, and that's what's wrong with let it. Let me ask you just quickly one more question. If these people, should, uh, these people that we're talking about being affected here, if it's not right for them to pay these taxes in this way, should we not say that salaried people should be able to keep their tax, tax money until the end of the year and all pay it in one lump sum then? Well, frankly, Mark, I don't think that we should have withholding taxes. You know, we had income tax to, uh, to finance World War I. We had withholding taxes coming out of the monthly or our bi-monthly checks during World War II to finance that. And so, you know, when it's almost an opiate, we take out so much money uh, every other week to pay the taxes. Now, you take a little guy that's making $15,000 a year, he's got a wife and two babies at home. He probably is going to be paying about $2,500 of that in taxes. Now, if you break that down on a bi-monthly basis and he's paying, say, $90 uh, every two weeks on his taxes, he really doesn't feel that too much because it becomes an opiate. But if he had to pay that tax, $2,500 at the end of the year, I think there'd be a lot of unhappy taxpayers in this country, and there probably be, would be another tax revolt like we had back in 1776, is it? Good year. Representative Good year. Gilbert, I, I guess you don't like this. I, <laughs> no, I don't like it at all, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. We'll I think back. you evaluated that correctly. Now let's get the view from two businessmen, one who favors the quarterly collection of income taxes and one who opposes. Ray Smelik is the supporter. Mr. Smelik is a general manager of the Boise division of Hewlett Packard, the big electronics firm. We've heard two view, views here about the fairness and equity, Mr. Smelik. Where do you come down? Well, let me make a couple of points here. Uh, first of all, um, I guess uh, from a fairness point of view, that's a word that tends to get overrated a lot, and I, I'm not sure that's really the issue that I want to address. My concern really has to do with the educational system uh, in this state. And from my perspective, uh, we are underinvesting in that, in that resource, which I think we really need in this state if we are going to have any kind of economic development over the long haul. 
I think there is evidence that the education uh, delivery system has lost ground in recent years. Um, so I don't favor this necessarily from a, from a tax point of view. I favor it if, in fact, that money will be used to, to support our educational system. I see. I think Representative Gilbert makes some good points, uh, but at the same time, I don't know that we'll solve the education problem by, by taking an attitude today that we're not going to have some taxes to, to fund uh, the educational system. So you, uh, you could see uh, some of the points that Mrs. Uh, Representative Gilbert makes about uh, small business. What about, uh, what about your company? What would the impact be on your company? Well, based on our estimates, if we were to pay our taxes uh, effectively three quarters earlier, uh, it would be about a million dollars um, and some lost opportunity of about another $110,000 uh, on top of that. So would that be a big impact? Well, I think that uh, none of us have that kind of money laying around, so sure it would have some impact. Percentage-wise, would it be easier for a company, though, like yours, a, a fairly large company with presumably a fairly substantial cash flow, to make, to make these payments, other than a, a small uh, mom-and-pop operator, so to speak? Well, I think it's a question of whether you have the cash or whether you have to go to the bank, uh, as Representative Gilbert suggested. And so I think it has just as much impact on a large corporation as a small one. A lot of the large corporations haven't had very good years either. So um, if you want to talk about fairness, then... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure that it would, uh, it would be less of an impact uh, for a larger corporation. Just to uh, repeat for emphasis, though, you see this as an idea to spend, to spend that additional money, even though it would be sort of a one-time only uh, expenditure, spend that money on education as the governor uh, has suggested. Yes, I think that in this year it's one way to help alleviate that problem. I think, again, though, we'd have a difficult problem next year. We'd have to take some more steps. But my main goal is to, is to do what we can to ensure that we have enough money to fund our educational system. Well, thank you. And now the view of yet another businessman, this one an opponent of the income tax collection idea. Mike Goffin is a small businessman, the owner of Michael's Furniture Showplace, a Boise furniture store. Specifically, Mr. Goffin, what would quarterly collections mean for your business? Well, it would just create, Mark, another hardship on our company, and we're coming through probably three of the worst years I've seen in the 23 years that I've been in the furniture business. And primarily, what we're looking at is that our fingernails are getting worn down from hanging on these last three years. I'm not sure exactly how much more impact, financial impact, we can stand as a small business. And to maybe broaden that a little bit, I had an opportunity today at uh, noon to have a, I was at a meeting with about 50 small business people from the Boise area, and I laid this whole question on them just to get a reaction. And I would tell you that unanimously, those people were opposed philosophically and practically to this whole idea. Because they, like myself, do not have the machinery in place, do not have the computers to kick out these numbers, Everything, you know, that we do as a small business primarily is done by hand. This would be an additional burden. In my case, particularly, I would have to have my accountant do it, which would be an additional cost factor. Frankly, our cash flow has just been, you know, right online. We're just making it. And I'm just getting, you know, I'm not putting out any bad checks. But I'll tell you, uh, it's not easy to maintain uh, a level of liquidity after coming off of three really tough years. And if I were forced to come up with cash flow on a quarterly basis, I probably would have to go borrow the money to do it. And it, and it kind of annoys me, Mark, because uh, I've got to go down and pay 15 or 18 percent interest to pay the state taxes on profit I haven't even earned yet, frankly, because I don't know when that profit's going to come. In the furniture business, twice a year is when we can make some money and Christmas being one of them, right. and certainly not in July. Well, let me, let me go back to a couple of these practical problems that it would, that it would raise for you. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned the borrowing, uh, but don't you already have to make, or many businesses already have to make these quarterly payments to the federal government? Would it be that much additional uh, accounting burden? It's just that much more, yes. It is that much more, and it's just something more for us to have to think about and do. And, and if it does uh, impact our cash flow, here again, it may take away an opportunity for me to make a good buy. Beyond that, you know, it is, it's a one-time windfall. And I looked on your, uh, on your uh, screen just prior to the interview here, and I see where the state government figures they're going to pick up $4.5 million 
by investing this money early, and I'm paying interest to give it to them. And to me, that makes no sense whatsoever. Let me, let me raise one final question with you, and that was Mr. Smellick's point about, uh, about funding education. Do you, uh, do you agree with his point on that, that, uh, that this could be invested in, uh, in, in better, better budgets, if you will, higher budgets for education? Well, I have no quarrel with, with funding education properly, and I think education in our state is a critical issue. I also know that, uh, having been around here a long time, that we uh, proposed a sales tax some years ago to fund education properly. We more recently, and I, and I get a big kick out of this, we more recently increased the sales tax 1%, which is incorrect. We did not increase it 1%. We increased it 1 percentile, it happened to be a third. It's 33 and a third percent more sales tax, and when this other half of percentile goes into place, we will have increased that sales tax 50 percent. Now, who's kidding who? You know, we, we need the education, certainly. But I get the feeling that this is the year that somebody said, hey, let's get the little business guy, you know? And everybody said, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Well, let's open this up. Mr. Seward, did you have a meeting and decide to get the little <laughs> business guy? <laughs> no, Mark. And in fact, uh, the sales tax gets the consumer who's, who's uh, purchasing the goods. And that's one of the complaints that you hear lodged against the sales tax is that, well, uh, corporations and businesses have received a number of tax, significant tax breaks from the state in the last couple of years that when it comes to replacing some of that lost revenue, uh, the state has turned to the, to the uh, wage earner to uh, look for those resources. Well, let's go back to some of these points that both uh, Representative Gilbert and Mr. Goffin raised. First, the cash flow problems of businesses. You heard, you heard Mr. Goffin say he might have, he'd very likely have to go borrow money to make these payments. Well, like I said earlier, Mark, we're not looking for any money from small businesses that they don't already owe the state. What we're looking for is a change in the timing at which it's sent to the state. Uh, if uh, Mr. Goffin has got that money invested so that he's earning interest on it, he'd lose that interest. If he's got it uh, plugged into inventory, then at some point he's going to have to dissolve that inventory in order to come up with the money to transfer the state. There's no easy solution for small business, it doesn't seem to me, either way, that if they're plugging that money, if they're using that money in the day-to-day -day working activities of their business, come April 15th, they're going to have to make some change in their business to come up with the cash to pay to the state, because they already owe it. Representative Gilbert? Well, Mark, you know, I think you have to consider, did business do its share this time? We raised $159 million of brand new tax to fund government and the bureaucracies. $159 million, brand new tax. And how much of that will be borne by the business community? 53%. They will have contributed $84.3 million of that increase. Now, I think business is doing its share. And you know, when you consider that business provides our tax base, our job base, our economic base, and if you want to destroy it, just keep plugging away at it because you're going to put people out of business and no longer will we have a viable economic base. And you know, business is us. It's all of us. You destroy it and you destroy our state. So we've got to keep a good business climate in this state. And I think business did its share by coming up with 53% <coughs> of the new taxation that we provided this year. Mr. Seward, comment? Well, I, I would dispute the 53 percent figure, but I, I, I agree with Representative Gilbert that, that our goal should be to uh, create a business climate in the state that's going to allow us to keep kids here, to provide them with good jobs that will allow them to, to make a reasonable living for themselves and their family. And, and as, as Mr. Smellick was indicating, that's the real issue here. Is, the, the money is to be earmarked for, for education, to try to, to raise us above the status that we find ourselves in now, 47th in the nation with our teacher salaries 20 percent below those of the neighboring states. And that's the real issue. Idahoans have traditionally been uh, well educated relative to the rest of the nation. It's been one of the strengths of the labor force here. It's one of the things that helps us attract new businesses. And I'm afraid if we allow Idaho to remain near the bottom of the nation with regard to the kind of education it provides its children that uh, will we'll go past the short-term problems of, of the economy that we're facing now and enter long-term decay in our economic system. Comment, Mr. Goffin? I, just, I would just like to say, that just sitting here listening, <coughs> that, that you know, I think we all make a mistake when we say the business community, the uh, people that are employed, the government. So, you know, uh, we're all one big family trying to solve some problems. And I 
pay monthly taxes the same as everybody else. Frankly, I don't know that it's a privilege that I heard commented on earlier. And uh, with regard to fairness, I would just say that two wrongs don't make a right ever. And I just can't see it. I think there are better ways to handle it. And we don't have time to go into it. Representative Gilbert, uh, Mr. Seward is suggesting that the real issue here really is a quality of uh, education, a quality of life, the quality of a business climate, if you will, that is generated by, uh, by good education. Well, Mark, I don't think uh, money and good education necessarily equate. We have, on the last 10 years, we have given increases to public schools 16% a year on an average. Now, one year was a 32% increase, and then one year it was a 1% increase, but on an average of 16%. I think this st state has done very well with public schools, has given it more than its share, probably when you consider that we had to put people out of work on Fridays, remember? The uh, health and welfare people and other agencies of government, they had to uh, take the day off because we couldn't afford to pay them. And you know, we still have the overrides. If the people want to pass uh, an override and fund education higher, let the people do it. But for right now, this year, I think we've got to hold the line so our people can recover economically because we're destroying people's businesses, we're destroying homes, and I think it's a critical problem. <clears throat> Mr. Smellick, Representative Gilbert seems to be suggesting that education's done pretty good in a pretty tough climate. Well, the numbers that I've seen don't quite indicate that. Um, the numbers I've looked at show that the funding for public education has grown about 17 percent over the last four years. Uh, that's for the whole four years, so per year that has not kept up with inflation. And my major concern is in higher education, where the higher education budget, as from the general uh, account, uh, has been virtually flat for four years. And unless we do something to raise the additional three million dollars that the governor is asking for, uh, will be flat again this year, and uh, even that's not going to be enough to do anything but to possibly hold us even. But we are losing, we are losing ground in our educational system. Quick comment. Let me ask Mr. Goffin then. If uh, Mr. Goffin is, uh, would it be more easier for you to take or other small businessmen to take if you put some sort of a floor in this? Uh, you heard Representative uh, Senator Bray talking earlier about a fifty thousand dollars, above fifty thousand dollars, above a hundred thousand has been talked about. Would that make it easier to take? Unquestionably, that would be a practical compromise. As I said earlier, philosophically, I don't really buy the whole program. I just don't. I understand what's being said here, but I'm having a hard time because it is a one-time windfall. It doesn't really gain a thing unless they, in fact, invest it, invest this money and pick up another four and a half million next year. But that could be a compromise position. It is, yeah, that's just what it is, is a compromise p position. I don't know that it's viable. Is that a compromise position for you, Representative Well, Gilbert? I think taxation should be equal. If it's good for the, big, for the big corporations, then I suppose it's good for the little corporations. I think that we, when we begin to make special uh, provisions for different classes, I think we begin to get in trouble. And I would, not, I would like to see it uniform and continue to be uniform. Does, as it is now. Does this have any chance in the special session? I would say no. Mr. Seward, any chance in the special session for this idea? Ask me in three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a, going to be an iffy proposition, though. Well, it's, it's clearly one of the least painful ways to raise the kind of money that's needed to, to just maintain our education system where it is today. We've got to go. Mr. Seward, uh, Mr. Smellick, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us tonight. Representative Gilbert, Mr. Goffin, thank you. That's all for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow. I'm Mark Johnson. Good night. This program is produced by the Idaho Educational Public Broadcasting System, which is solely responsible for its content. The funding for this program is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Friends of 4, 10, and 12.